company we were lucky because after the government's uh, act east policy the ministry of petroleum almost made numaliga refinery the fulcrum of its act east policy for the hydrocarbon industry yes sir a lot of hydrocarbon potential is there in the northeast untapped for various reasons i am not getting into it but let me tell you the experience of two countries we had maybe we have to mitigate those things if we have to really promote uh, trade between the two countries almost a, a decade back numaliga refinery exported two two parcels of diesel to bangladesh i mean very innovatively our team sent it by waterways all the way from numaliga to to dhaka it was almost an uphill task because those days the environment in assam was not good night navigation was not possible security was a threat customs understanding and interactions between two governments were almost as bureaucratic as it was possible in spite of all that we managed to send two two parcels but after that we thought if we do that we cannot run our refinery i mean that was the amount of effort and uh, paperwork required it was left off two and a half years back we we have sent the first parcel of diesel by rake from siliguri in west bengal all the way to a place called parbatipur north north bangladesh you know uh, the the hardening point is we started with siliguri the first parcel when we went it went through a place called ratikapur the distance was almost 540 kilometers one month down the line we again sent the second parcel and we went through a place called rohan rohanpur the distance came down to 240 kilometers now we are looking at a at a rail connect where the distance comes to almost 100 kilometers we have made so much of progress such that in the last one month after the prime ministers of both countries met and the external affairs minister went to dhaka recently i happen to be there signing an agreement now we are looking at sending rakes almost every week two rakes and our company we don't even know it's become as business as usual that's the progress we have made and we think the potential to supply to parvatipur or the north of bengal i mean north of bangladesh is so high that the last time when we went we signed an agreement to build a pipeline from siliguri to parvatipur the distance is about 145 kilometers the government of india is funding the bangladesh portion about 280 crores at siliguri it's of course numaligarh it's our pipeline about 60 crores i think we have made a wonderful progress and the future is lot of hopes the second experience numaligarh happens refinery happens to be the largest producer of wax in the country bangladesh was one market which we approached lot of interest because all the wax was coming from china language interaction i think price was a factor because they were they had no other source when we came into the market a lot of people approached us so the first person who took <coughs> the parcel from us 20 tons just one lorry container so we asked them how do we reach bangladesh which port he had he wanted to go through what is that please somewhere near of calcutta starting oh, eh? no benapol benapol sorry i am not too familiar it he wanted benapol for whatever reasons i'm sure he had his reasons his contacts we we dispatched from numaliga 240 from kilometers from guwahati guwahati to calcutta and then every day we track because it was important first customer in bangladesh they had to have can you imagine 12 days the lorry had to the container had to wait at the point to move over i don't think anyone can do business with as it is the journey from guwahati to numaligarh i mean numaligarh to guwahati and guwahati to numaligarh almost 6 to 8 days and another 12 days waiting it was impossible then we suggested why don't you try through dauki now dauki there is another problem which cropped up which is it cannot take a 20 tonner the the bridges i believe on the way to dauki cannot take 20 tonner so i think there are enough impediments to prevent doing business with bangladesh but i am sure we will overcome it i just happened to i have retired just on the first on the 31st of october i i was driving down i asked my colleague what happened to the thing he says so oh, we have got two orders from bangladesh so the potential is high 
I think our product is good. Our, the experience of dealing with our people is good. Maybe, I don't know, I don't think oil companies can build the infrastructure, but potential is fantastically high. The diesel is there, the pipeline is being built. 36 months from now, the pipeline, and I'm sure they can't resist, because otherwise they bring product into Chittagong, and Chittagong all, way, all the way to Parvatipur is an is a uphill task. Riverine routes, roads, rail, all sorts of problems, whereas just in 145 kilometers pipeline, they can supply. I think, we, I'm sure in a couple of years the potential is very high and with all the, the intergovernmental interactions, nothing can stop us. Coming to Myanmar, Myanmar was a country which I visited about six months back and two years back. You can't imagine the metamorphosis of the country. It, it seems to have just changed and blossomed. It's almost like being in India. When we went first, People don't, I mean, they were hesitant to talk to us. The receptionist at the hotel, the cab driver, or anyone you talk to, you know, very restrained, constrained discussion. And this time, just six months back, we went, it, it was almost like being in Guwahati. Of course, the, the place changed much, much better. There we exported the wax. They all, um, uh, Myanmar is a country of pagodas. Everyone who walks into a pagoda, burns minimum two candles, depending on his pocket, if not many, many more. So we found that this is a fabulous opportunity for us. We went there and we got the order because otherwise it was being just flooded, by, I mean, dominated by Chinese market. So we got the order. Again, it was, you can imagine what our people would have gone through, what the Myanmar traders would have gone through. We, we brought the product all the way from Numaligar to Guwahati, Amin Nagar was the train hub, we moved it to Haldia. We reached Haldia, after that we can't find a ship to move it to Yangon. No ship sails with products or containers from, Yang, from Haldia or Calcutta to, to Yangon. So the transshipment had to be done either through Taiwan or Singapore and then from there it goes to Yangon. And at least four or five people, I mean, during our visit, we met a lot of people who wanted uh, candle because there seems to be a flourish, who wanted wax from us, seems to be a flourishing industry. Even now they are taking. In spite of all these bottlenecks and everything, they are still taking. Seems to be a very big opportunity. When we were in Myanmar, of course, pulses and cereals seems to be the product from there. There is no vessel sailing. sailing from, the only vessel which sails from Yangon to India is to Chennai. I think historical connect was there, but I don't know why not Calcutta. I think a lot of, lot of the previous speakers have talked about it. I can't understand why it cannot happen. I'm sure it must be much easier, just a bit of political willpower. Then came our hydrocarbon experience. Mr. The Parambi... Parambi Energy was a company which approached us. Again, we, we targeted north of, north of Bangladesh, I mean north of Myanmar. They bring product from Yangon all the way to Thambu is the place in north thing which is the hub. We found that it was almost 1,700, 1,700, I'm just telling out of memory. Again, through waterways and during the monsoons, it's almost impossible to reach the place. It, and the monsoons in Myanmar are quite heavy. So we we got a party who, who has pro picked up the product from us at Numaligar. We go all the way to More, Arunachal Pradesh. Then there is a transshipment point across the border where uh, the product is transferred from our lorry, our tankers into their tankers and then it is distributed. I think it was a wonderful experience to, to sell to Myanmar. People are very good, they are very fast. There were two things I just wanted to, I mean, now if the business progresses, we are looking at providing a pipeline from Numaligar all the way to More, More, Arunachal Pradesh to Tambu. Not only the export, it facilitates even all the other areas like Kohima and Imphal, not Im, Imphal, I think, capital of Arunachal. Everywhere, you know, at the drop of a hat, you have a, you have, you have a roadblock and, few, is, no, is it Itana? Manipur. I am talking about uh, Manipur. Manipur, I am sorry. Manipur. More is the, bo is, is the place from where we sent. More is the border between India and uh, Myanmar. 
a pipeline is being proposed all the way from Numaligar to supply there so that it can be eased out. Two things, just an experience to show how, how backward India is compared to Myanmar. The customs officer at Moray when we approached, uh, it was a lady, she says this is the first parcel of hydrocarbon being exported to Myanmar. So big processes, but of course we had, they had a lot of pressure because the Prime Minister was landing two days after that in Myanmar, so it was a big process to send the first lorry there. They responded. Then she says, not, no trade takes place between Myanmar and this, and we are standing at the border and we find vans and vans of goods coming from Myanmar into India. It's filled with goods, you can see it, in, but the customer officer feels no goods are moving, but the potential seems to be so high to move from Myanmar into, into the northeast and east of India. And the other thing you notice is, Moray, when you go, it, it is like a one-house town, as usual, as any town of our country. You go into Tambu, and then you find they seem to have grown, developed so much. It's a fabulous place. I mean, every, every, every automobile company in the world seems to be having a, work sh uh, a showroom just across the border. It's only a bridge. Myanmar seems to be a great potential. I w before I conclude, I think all of us talk about uh, infrastructural issues existing between the regions. I had a friend who two years back drove from Kochi all the way to Indonesia and back to Kochi in 100 days. He stayed with me in Guwahati alone. He, took, he was uh, driving alone and he went. I am wondering if the infrastructure is bad, how we made it in 100 days. Just a thought for you. Thank you. Thank you for your patient hearing. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, let's move on. Our next speaker is General Mukherjee. It's John Mukherjee. Sir, over to you, sir. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm very thankful to BCCI and SNSK for asking me to speak to you. And it's an honor to be amongst you today. I'm going to focus totally on the Northeast, not on Bengal. I have a message from both the Chief Minister of Meghalaya and the Chief Minister of Mizoram. They've apologized profusely. I was actually chartered to try and get them, but they're so busy election campaign, campaigning to try and ensure BJP doesn't come into power in either Meghalaya or uh, Mizoram. They said, sorry, we've got no time. In fact, they didn't come to the office. Uh, all their residences for 25 days that I was running after them, finally I spoke to them on phone. So they conveyed their apologies and asked me to communicate on their behalf. What are my credentials for communicating? Only 56 years experience of either living with the people of the Northeast. I come from the Assam Regiment, which recruits people from all over the Northeast, with whom I served for 40 years. I'm married to a Northeasterner. And... Uh, I've lived with them almost all my life, since the age of 17. Wonderful people. Now the Actis policy, as far as the northeastern region of India is concerned, is supposed to be the instrument of the government of India to develop the northeast. In reality, India's Actis policy is really the seaward movement. Very little actually happening on ground in the northeast region. Now, I have only 10 minutes. So I'm going to rush through and give you a totally different perspective wherein I, say, I f honestly feel that a lot of what has been said, I put it as a blunt soldier, has been nonsense. Uh, Firstly, there's no such thing as a Northeasterner. 
There is no such thing. There are 453 different tribes, of which 120 are major, each one of which is just moving on to modernity, from tradition to modernity. As a result, there is tremendous sub-nationalism. Tremendous sub-nationalism. Every tribe for itself. You catch hold of a Mizo, he says, I'm interested in myself, there's no such thing as Northeast. The Assamese is a Vai, an outsider. The Bangladeshi, God forbid, how can he come in? This is my area. There's no such thing as a Naga. There are 35 different uh, tribes amongst the Nagas. Each one of them hates each other's guts. So, that's the sort of situation you're dealing with when you're talking about development of the Northeast region. 453 different tribes, each wanting their share of the pie, the pie of development. Now, what, what moves on from there? The government of India plans that they'll get this development through by connectivity, without realizing and without consulting the people on ground. The aspirations of the people on ground are not being met. Delhi's aspirations are being attempted to be met. Connectivity is not physical. Connectivity is in the mind. If there is no mental connectivity, there is no connectivity at all. There's just a road or an inland water transport route, but there is no connectivity. And that connectivity can only happen once there is mental connectivity, which means people-to-people -people contact and the aspirations of people on ground are met. You want trade to flow and development to take place, whether you like it or not, those routes have to pass through peaceful areas. Your first pre prerequisite is peace. You plan a nation and highway through Manipur, which is perhaps in a worse state than Jammu and Kashmir. Only, Jam only on Manipur doesn't hit the headlines. Jammu and Kashmir does. The fact remains is Law and order situation in Manipur is the worst in India. A truck driver traveling from just Guwahati, not the rest of India, will pay one and a half lakhs as in taxes to the insurgents. Forget about the actual cost of transport, transportation. As taxes to the 35 different insurgent groups through which that so-called Asian highway is supposed to ply. As a result, not a single truck driver goes. No traffic flows. All traffic flows, only in escorted convoys. Once in a day. If you're lucky, if your turn has come. Otherwise, once in three days. People don't realize, in terms of forget the taxes that are paid, the cost of transportation from, let us say, Imphal to, to Yangon, works out to be, to be about 35 rupees per ton, uh, 35 dollars per ton, US dollars per ton. Whereas, if the same uh, produce, whichever is passing, is coming from the rest of India, or for that matter, even from Guwahati, via, via Calcutta or any of the other seaports on the eastern seaboard, going on to Yangon, even though it goes around the Straits of Malacca, works out approximately the same. But the advantage is that in terms of bulk, the sea route is taking the bulk, whereas your road route is not taking the bulk. So your overall cost analysis, when you are looking at the cost analysis of using the Asian highway for trade vis-a-vis -vis the sea route, sea route is 50% cheaper than the road routes. The only people who benefit from the road routes and the Asian highway would be Mizoram or Manipur. Those are the only two states that will benefit. But what do they have to offer? Nothing. They only have to offer open borders and Chinese goods flowing in. And that's the actual situation on ground. Delhi talks big about the Kaladan route. Absolute nonsense. It's a preposterous project. You've created a Sitway port. 
people didn't do their homework, it's actually only a shallow water port, the old Akyap. So today's ships have to anchor 10 kilometers offshore, transship into tugs, tugs move on to Setwe port, which is still in the process of final dredging, as a shallow water port, transport, transport into inland water transport provided by India. From there, they are supposed to move up uh, upstream, up the Kaladan River, or the Kaladan, up to a place called Palethwa, which is 100 kilometers off, through two lock gates, spending two days to, trans, uh, to uh, pass through those lock gates. There is no connecting road, so you have to go up that way by IWT, offload again at Palethwa. The road is supposed to go from there on to Zorin Pui in Mezu, Mizoram, and from there further on to Longtalai. Between Zorin Pui and Palethwa, people have not yet even worked out the details of how to construct the road. There is no road on ground. So give that another 10 years for that road to come through. From Zorin Pui to Longtalai on the Indian side in Mizoram, you've got 100 kilometers of beautiful four lane highway. Seven bridges not constructed. Land acquisition problems, I'd say another 10 years to go for that. Huge swath, 100 meters wide, for deforested area. To construct the road, 30,000 acres of land laid waste. No replanting carry on, uh, being carried out. That's reality on ground. Once you've reached Longtalai, from a four-lane highway, you are coming onto a single-lane highway <laughs> and you hope connectivity will carry on through there. And what has happened is, when you ask any trader, he says, who's going to use this route? It doesn't work for us. So you have, you've spent a colossal amount of money through Sitwe and all these routes, but it's not cost-effective. It was only a strategic asset now in case Bangladesh doesn't play ball. All the oil industry decides to move a pipeline along it. It's much simpler if you want to trade, go straight to the Chinese port of Chokpu, which is 50 kilometers south of uh, uh, Sitwe, and from there use the Chinese highway to Mandalay. Very honestly. That's the cheapest way of transportation now. From Vizag or Calcutta port, straight on to Chokpu, by the, super, the Chinese super highway to Mandalay and then from there on to Yangon or Yunnan. That's the actual reality of things. Now, I'm not going to take anything, any more time. I'm just going to end by saying this, that there is, the entire thing of acting East and allowing all this flow to take place is a cultural shock for the people of the entire region. People don't work on Sundays. Every shop is closed. You won't get a cup of tea anywhere en route. Outsiders are not accepted. It's a mental block to all this. You've got to change that mental block. Only then can connectivity and development take place. You've got to change, switch to modernity. Till that happens, forget it. Act East doesn't work. Thank you. The next speaker, uh, Mr. Chatterjee, who is the Chief Corporate Officer, Legal and Corporate Affairs at DIC India. Mr. Chatterjee, please. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks to BCCI for giving me the opportunity to share my views on this subject, although my paid subject is always taxations. But somewhere or other I will try to elaborate this matter since I am from the industry and we have reasonable amount of business in South Asia, Southeast Asia. Now one question I would like to discuss and share with you, 
why investment in the east is so low you will be surprised to know in the last 15 months 90% of the total fdi is shared by only four states maharashtra gujarat delhi and karnataka and maharashtra share is 40.44% and only 10% fdi has come to the other states i know most of you will say that it is because of wrong perceptions political problem and other things as if political situation in maharashtra is extremely good political situation in delhi is extremely good according to me it is a myth there are specific reasons for which east is lagging behind and to some extent it is natural i am not talking about the mining industry or refinery oil industry because it is located in a particular place you cannot change it but i am talking about other industries in spite of having so many benefits in the east in terms of cost of inflation living standard reasonable amount of skill labor availability by and large you have everything you have sea you have river you have mountain you have forest you have green which is like nothing at all one of the major reasons which stood on the way was infrastructure irregular taxation systems i think some of you will start feeling that i have brought taxation because i am a person from taxation you will be surprised to know that a truck takes 25 to 30 days time from kolkata to bangladesh i am not i have not taken any statistics from any book it is my actual statistics if you want i can show it to you that too from kolkata factory to the our clearance at customs now you think the logistic cost the logistic cost of exporting material to bangladesh total material imported by bangladesh in a country is around 35 billion dollar and india's share is around 